Bible study that was derived by Jason Dimitri, our church leader, that he did pre present over there at the staff. It's called the movement study. But before we get into it, let's go to John chapter 4 real quick. Before we get into this past, uh, get, get into the study. I just got something to share in my heart with you guys. It's in John 4, verse 34. I mean, what an amazing couple of weeks it's been. It's coming here every Wednesday night. And I don't know about you, but I had a lot of fun being together with the men and the women. And I do believe right now we have about 74 days left in the year. 74 more days in 2023, which is the year of miracles. And God has done amazing miracles so far, has he not, over here in the City of Angels. But we got 74 more days of miracles. In John 4, verse 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months till the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws wages and harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows another reaps. It's true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. You know, it's an amazing passage here where Jesus says, my food, what gets me going, my fuel. It's not maybe chicken and rice. It's not McDonald's. It's not Wingstop. It's not none of that. He says, my food is to do the will of the Father. And we know from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, God's will is for all men to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And we know that how we participate in that is to go and make disciples of all nations. And he says that don't say, let's wait until 2024 for a greater harvest. He says, don't look at 2023 and look at all the miracles and say, well, we did a lot, Lord. Can't we just take a break? He says, open your eyes right now. There's still a harvest to be had. And I know we've been giving our hearts. I know we've been working hard. I know we've been active co-workers with the Lord, but let us not grow weary. It would be a shame for us to have such a powerful beginning of the year and middle and third quarter, but then falter in the fourth quarter. Let's make a decision tonight to go out of here now equipped with the first principles in our hearts to teach it to other people and help make more disciples in the final quarter of 2023. Are you guys with me here tonight? Now we're going to do a study here tonight uh, called the Movement Study. Before we get into it, let's say a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. We're so grateful for the opportunity to worship you. And I pray, God, you can just be with this time. Help us, Lord, to get closer. Help us, God, to understand the movement more. Help us, God, to continue to fight for you and give you all the glory and to finish the work. We love you so much. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this study, really, what it's all about is answering the question, was the first century church a movement of God that was one body, or was it a group of autonomous churches that were self-governing and a loose fellowship that was not unified? Obviously, anyone who's read the book of Acts already knows the answer to that. But I do believe as disciples, it is very important for us to have a conviction on why we are the movement of God, why we believe in our core convictions, and why we believe that in the dream of the evangelization of the nations in this generation. You know, I remember being a, uh, a minister over there at San Jose State, and there's a group that was very hostile towards our group on that campus that was an offshoot of the four fellowships at ICOC. And I remember one, one day the leader uh, cornered me and, uh, and sat, sat me down. Greta Lester was there. She wasn't in the meeting, but she was, she was my co-leader that time. And they were grilling me on and telling me that, hey, at the end of the day, this, this, this whole new thing that Kip started, it's going to fail. And, and you should save yourself now before you get super hurt in the future. And this guy was incredibly bitter, obviously. Um, and he, it, it was sad that he was you know, uh, doing a lot of reckless things on campus. But it helped me understand why I need to have a deep conviction on why we believe what we believe. 
even, I remember one time being a minister at City College San Francisco, there was a man that, that came there, amen, some Lee got baptized over there, thank God. I remember a man came to my Bible talk who was a part of the ICOC of that time and came just to derail the Bible talk and to get people to, get, to become confused. And after the Bible talk, he told, he, he told me that, hey, man, the whole idea of evangelizing the world in this generation is not a biblical stance. And I was about four months old spiritually. So I was like, man, how do I defend this truth? So I hope here tonight we get a deeper conviction why we believe in the core convictions of the church. And for the leaders, we will have a quiz on this at leaders' meeting, amen? So I hope you do pay attention to what we call the movement study. Now, we do have five convic core convictions in the church. Uh, number one, we believe that we are a Bible church, amen? Not just a New Testament church, but Old Testament and New Testament can be used to teach, correct, rebuke, and train in righteousness. We also believe that we speak where the Bible is silent and silent where the Bible speaks, and we talked about that during the church study last week. And number three, we also believe that every member should be a soul disciple and be in the discipling relationship. We believe discipling is not optional, but it is a command of God. In Matthew 28, the Bible says that go make disciples, teach them to obey everything after you baptize them. So that's why we believe discipling is a command of the Lord. And we also believe in the vision to evangelize the world in this generation. And finally, we believe in a centralized leadership with a centralized leader. Now, this study really does hone in on that last conviction there, a centralized leader with a centralized leadership. What this means is understanding that the church has one guy that is leading the church through an effort of many other people who will be a part of that centralized leadership. And the question we have to ask ourselves here tonight, is that a biblical viewpoint of how the church should function? And we're going to see very clearly from the scriptures, it absolutely is. So we're going to look at a series of scriptures in the Old and New Testament and weave through this conviction and see exactly why we believe it as a church. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18, we're going to start off in verse 12. So the scene here is Moses with the people of Israel as they were set free from the yoke of slavery of Pharaoh. And you have to understand that God's people at this time, they don't have an idea of government, don't have an idea of how to be free as they were slaves for 400 years. And we see Moses attempting to lead God's people into freedom. So it's very clear that Moses was the central leader of the Exodus movement. Why did God choose Moses? Well, you can ask God when you get to heaven. Moses was God's man, and he led them into the desert. Now we understand that to make it into the promised land, and that's when Joshua comes to play. We're going to look at that a little bit later. But in Exodus chapter 18, we pick it up. Let's actually pick up in verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13, actually pick it up in verse 12. Let's do verse 12. Exodus 18, verse 12. It says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and offered sacrifice to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as a judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw what that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all the, these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way that you are to live and how you are, they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate this honest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. 
Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide for themselves that, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So this is a very staple passage, not just for the church, but also just for the world. In this, in this passage, what happened is Jethro... Moses' father-in-law comes and sees Moses just sitting at a seat, and then people, millions of people flock to him every day, and they bring every single problem to Moses. Could you imagine being in a position where millions of people have your phone number, and at any moment, they can call you and ask you to fix their problems? Like, hey, man, my, my, the, my roommate didn't wash the dishes. And he refuses to wash the dishes. What do you want me to do about it, Moses? Hey, man, uh, I got a flat tire. Uh, uh, what, can, what should I do about it? That's what Moses was doing for millions of people. How overwhelming do you think that will be? And Jethro sees it like, Moses, what are you doing? Like, this is absolutely silly. You're, you're going to get burnt out. And what the Bible here says, he says, select capable men that fear God, that can help you, that could be leaders of hundreds, fifties, and tens, and then everyone can go home satisfied. And we even see this in companies, in Fortune 500 companies. You have a CEO, then you have people under the CEO, and it's a pyramid of people. Someone's at the top, and then there's people over there that are going to help make sure that the company runs smooth. The same way in the church. We need men and women to be able to help the church stay faithful and help it stay healthy. If we do not have leaders in the church, then the church or the people in the church would not go home satisfied. It will be very unsatisfying for every single member of even the super region, the Metro Coast, if you expect Matt and I and Regina and Selma to disciple every single person in the region. That, that, that will be 120-some D times. That will be absolutely impossible. That's why, especially as we grow at this time, it's imperative that many of us here get a dream to raise on up in the Lord so that we can see more people take care of the sheep that are going to be coming into the fold. We're going to have a really bad problem in the church. If next year, as we grow at the same rate, but then not have more people to serve and lead to take care of the people, men and women who fear God, men and women who are capable, so that every single member can go home satisfied in the Lord. And I want to make sure that we understand this conviction of a centralized leadership. That every single one of us, we talked about it last week uh, on, during the church study, we need to find well, how can we help the church in this way? How can we lead and help people make sure they go home satisfied? So we see it very clearly in the Old Testament. Now let's see in the New Testament. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's see the same concept in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. They got rid of the little fan here. I'm dying. What happened to the little fan, Augustine? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I, was, I was banking on that fan. Oh, there we go. Let's give it up for Daniel Smith, guys. It's a, it's a mobile fan. Saved, saved me tonight. Thank you, bro. Second Timothy chapter 2, let's see the same concept in verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me with the suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So this passage, we understand 2 Timothy is one of the last writings of the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to his young protege, Timothy, as he is leading the church over there in Ephesus. And he says that, Timothy, do not forget the things that I taught you and find reliable men that can teach others. So here in this passage, we see four generations of discipleship. You have Paul, who is the overseer of the church. 
Then you have Timothy, who is leading the church. And then he says, find reliable men. And then the reliable men teach others. So we see the same concept of the Jethro principle that we saw in Exodus 18, also in the New Testament. So it's very clear as we even go through many other passages that the New Testament had an idea of a centralized leadership. So they could also imitate the heart of Jethro and Moses there that everyone could, get, could go home satisfied in the Lord. Now there's a plethora amount of other verses we could look at, but for the sake of time we're not going to look at them. But then we have to also ask the question, okay, we understand the concept of centralized leadership and discipling, but what about the concept of a central leader? of having someone overseeing all the centralized leadership and, make, and having that person be the central leader of God's church. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Numbers 27. Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27, in verse 12. The Bible says in verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain, the Abram range, and see the land I have given the Israelites. After you've seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this com community to go out and c come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So over here, we understand because of Moses' sin, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. And what happens is he hikes up a mountain, Mount Nebo, which means prophet, he goes to the mountain of prophets. And he goes there, and all he can do is see the promised land and not enter it. And then his one last request to God was to find a man who could be a shepherd to God's sheep. And he says, choose the man Joshua. So we understand that Moses had a deep conviction that if they did not have a leader, these people will be like sheep without a shepherd. And Matthew preached on it on Sunday about that little meme of that sheep that goes into that ditch and the shepherd rescues the little sheep, but then goes right back into it. It's so important to have shepherds. And Moses understood this very well. And what happens is that Joshua does become the leader. And when you read the book of Joshua, there's some great victories there. But then let's see what happens when Joshua's about to go. Let's now go to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, in verse 14. Bob says in verse 14, this is the last word of Joshua before he dies. It says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. Where the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates are the gods of the Amorites in whose your land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You know, any, any great father would have this, you know, this, this verse read to their household. And any great household leader would also read this to their household as well. And it's amazing what Joshua says. It's like, hey, guys, like, we're gonna, I'm going to serve God. I don't know about you guys, but we're going to serve the Lord in my household. If you want to go and serve the different gods of the people in these foreign nations, then go ahead. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, it sounds good, and it is good for him and his house, but it's not good for the people he's leading. And we see that Joshua didn't have the same conviction that Moses had in terms of having a central leader. 
Then what happens in the book of Judges, which in sequence is after Joshua, you can read the book of Judges on your own time. It is one of the darkest times in all of the Bible. Terrible, detestable things that never happened before happened in that book. And the theme of the book was everyone did as they saw fit because there was no king in Israel. So what led to the destruction of the people of Israel in the book of Judges? They did not have a central leader. They did not have a shepherd that was going to lead the flock. And that led to the destruction of God's people. And let us have a conviction as well as brothers and sisters that we're grateful for the leadership in God's church because it keeps the order. It keeps things going. And we see it very clearly in the Old Testament that when they did not have a leader, everything went into shambles. Now we understand this in anything. You gotta have a leader in everything. Like if you're on a basketball team and there's no captain, everyone's doing whatever they want. In a Bible talk, if there's no Bible talk leader, everyone can do whatever they want. In a household, there better be some good household leaders. And I know we got some good household leaders in the Metro Coast. If there's no household leaders, people can do whatever they want. In a marriage, the way it works, we know the brothers are not smarter, amen. They're not better, but God shows them, especially for some of you brothers, amen. But God shows them, and especially for me, I mean, my wife graduated from Columbia University. I mean, I, I think we already know who's the brains in, 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 our, in, our, in our relationship. <laughs> but God chose me to lead the relationship. And if, if you're asking, hey, where, where do you want to go eat? You need someone to make that final decision. And I've learned that very well. Because it can be so confusing. Like, where, where should we go eat? Well, I don't know. Well, you need a leader to make a decision. In the same way in God's church, we need leadership to make decisions so that we can glorify God. Now, I think what, what we have to understand, leadership, we're not perfect. I mean, you can spend one day with me and you can quick, quickly find that out. Man, I spent one day with your Bible talk leader. You can really find out some things. Trust me, I disciple them. But we make plans to do good. And if it's a plan to do good, we as disciples get behind it and say it's a good plan. And we understand that in the New Testament, they also had a centralized leader. Let's see in Acts 15. I, and I, I hope that we really pay attention to these passages because the Bible says that the people can perish because of a lack of knowledge. And as we talked about last week in our church study, we can easily repeat history. We can repeat history of those who attempted to evangelize the world but then couldn't do it. Or we can repeat the history of the first century church brothers and sisters that attempted to evangelize the world, and they actually did it. So for me, even as a young Christian, it just made sense. If we want to do this, we should just look at what they did in the book of Acts. Yeah. And then we see what they did in the book of Acts, and we emulate that, and we repeat it, we imitate it. It is a for sure fact you will see similar results in your church. Did the book of Acts church in the first century have a central leader? But one can say in Matthew 16, when Jesus gives the Peters, or the Peters, the keys to the Peter, to Peter over there, the keys of the king of the Peter, blah, 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 messing up over here, the Peters, the keys, the keys of the kingdom to Peter, we know that Acts 2, he is the primary speaker. The Bible says he raises up, he preaches, and the apostles raise up and preach with them, but he is the primary speaker showing he was the leader of the first century church. Now, at some point in the history of the book of Acts, you can see it after Acts 12 when Peter is faithless in prison, he switches over from being the main character of the book of Acts, and now the main character is all about Paul's endeavors and his companions. And then we see something interesting in Acts chapter 15 where there's an issue in the church. There are people teaching false doctrine that you had to first get circumcised and become a Jew before you could be saved and they're called the circumcision group. Some commentaries believe that it came from those priests that were baptized in Acts chapter six, but who knows? So what happens is 
Peter, who was at some point the first century church leader, he was the one that God gave the vision to open up the kingdom to the Gentiles. And yet at some point, he allowed these false teachers to poison his convictions. If Peter could get poisoned, any of us can get poisoned. And in the book of Galatians, Paul opposes him to his face and rebukes him in front of the church, saying that this is not right. But they had to get a unity on what is going to be the decree that's going to be made in the church. So what happens? In Acts 15, what we're going to read right now, Paul, his companions, and the other apostles travel to Jerusalem so they could get a unified decree. And let's see what happens in Acts 15. And we're going to read verse 6. And give me an amen once you're there. Verse 6, the Bible says, The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we or, nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly came silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James, who is a half-brother of Jesus, spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins will, I will build and I will restore it, and that the rest of mankind, not just the Jews, may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles to return to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So what's this all mean? So what happens is they go to Jerusalem, they have this council. And many people speak their own perspective on what should happen with this group and what should be the decree of the church. When Paul and Barnabas, they're speaking, there's silence amongst the assembly, but then there's one man that stands up and gives the final decree. And that is James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, who writes the book of James. And he says over here, here's the decree, quoting a scripture from Amos chapter 9, verse 9, that the kingdom of God was not just for the Jews or those who would convert to Judaism. The kingdom of God is for Gentiles well. And we say amen to that because all of us over here are Gentiles to my knowledge. None of us are Jews. Amen. Except for Bryce, who's at kid's kingdom, amen? But he's not here right now. And it clearly shows that once James said this, this was when they sent the letter to say this is the final decree of the church. It shows very clearly that James was the first century church leader at this time. And then, for a second time, we're not going to go to it, but also in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 8, we see that James was the first one that was mentioned amongst Peter, James, and John. James was the first one, it says James, Peter, and John. And it shows in Jewish literature, whoever is named first is the person of leadership in that group. And this scripture clearly teaches us that the book of Acts had a central leader. And we too believe that as well in our church. We have central leader and a centralized leadership. We understand that Kip is the central leader of the church and he has world sector leaders around him and world sector leader shepherds like the Christians who are, are serving in that role. And we believe that some people could get weird about having a guy at the top. They get weird about it. Like, oh, like, who's this guy like, like at the top and running all the shots? No, we understand that is God's method. And that is the, the way that the church must, must function. So it's very clear from Acts 15 that we do have a central leader. Now, what are the effects of this? 
Number one is a unified doctrine. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're almost done here. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. So what makes this a movement? Well, what makes this a movement? Well, having unity. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 4 says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you, my dear children, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers for in Christ Jesus. I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He reminds you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So this passage teaches us that there is an issue in the church, in, in the church over there in Corinth. And you can read the book of Corinthians, and there's a lot of bad things happening there. And Paul says the solution is, I can't at this time attend and fix it up, but I'm going to send my son of faith, Timothy, and he will remind you of everything I teach that is unified in every single church around the world. And that's why we have the first principles. We, we believe that in every church around the world, no matter where you go, whether you're in China, whether you're in Hawaii, whether you're over here in Los Angeles or San Francisco or somewhere in Louisiana, it doesn't matter if sold out disciples are there, they should be teaching the unified doctrine of God's word. And isn't it amazing that you see the Bible in your church and the church in the Bible? That's what we're doing. Unified doctrine. We went to Mexico City for a little conference there. It was amazing to see a unified doctrine there. And many of us have been able to go to the Philippines. Many of us went over to EMC. Some of the disciples are going to EMC later on. And it's amazing to talk to disciples. And you know when you talk to a disciple. Yeah. They talk the same. They, they walk the same. They have the same convictions because we believe that we should be a movement of God. Amen. Unified doctrine, but then also a benefit, and what, uh, we understand what a movement is, is the sharing of resources. And we could just dot this down. One, we know there's different needs that come, come from the church. And there's needs that came over here in the city of Angels, even for us to hit, for me personally, as a region leader over here in the Southland, there's a need in the East. And I understand that I don't, this is not my church. This is God's church. And these are God's people. So God's people, they're like the wind. They go wherever they're needed. And we see in the scriptures that when there is a need in a church, even right here over here in Corinth, they said we need Timothy. So they said, hey, we're going to send Timothy over there. And we have a belief in that, that we share because we understand that we are a unified movement. If one part is weak, we're all weak. If one part is strong, we celebrate with them. But we understand that that is who we are as a movement. And to be honest, it, it, it makes more sense to me, um, you know, why people want to be autonomous. Because when you're autonomous, you make the final shots. And no one can tell you anything. You're like, hey, this is my, I can do whatever I want. But that is, that's sinful. And it will lead to destruction. That's why we have a conviction on having a unified movement. But also the sharing of money. Right now, we're giving missions. Why? Because we believe in world evangelism. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16. In verse 1. The sharing of money. Verse 1, Bible says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money and keep it with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men who you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. So we hear there's a special collection being made for God's people. And Paul says that I'm going to send them to bring it to Jerusalem. So it's amazing. Here's the church in Corinth raising money that's then going to be sent to another church that was in need. And it sounds just like special missions, where this year we're planting 29 churches around the world. And all those churches are going to need monetary sacrifice 
to not just survive, but to thrive in the Lord. So that's why we believe in the sharing of resources as the movement of God, because we see it right here in the Bible. What's another thing that's effects of a movement? Number one, the third thing is rapid growth. For the sake of time, we're not going to go through all the passages, but you know in Acts chapter 2, the first church service, 3,000 people got baptized. By Acts 4, we see that there's 5,000 men in the church. In Acts 6, it says that many, that it not just increased, but it increased rapidly, and many priests became obedient to the faith and became baptized disciples. Then in Acts 17, it says that these men who've been all around the world, they have such a rapid effect, such a powerful effect on that generation, it said that they turned the whole world upside down. That was the effect of the first century church movement, rapid growth. And we can say the same thing that God is doing over here in the city of angels and in the mood of God all around. With 42 disciples that started over there in 2007, now in 2023 we're seeing rapid growth that we see over 11,000 disciples all around the world. We're seeing rapid growth because of our convictions being a movement of God. You know, it says in Ephesians 4 that there should be one body. And Philippians 2, it says that we should have the same spirit and the same purpose. I hope that we all share that spirit, that same purpose, and that we have that same vision. That the person to your right, the person to your left, the person behind you, the person in front of you. That we all share this conviction that we believe that we must be God's movement. Let's close out in Acts chapter 5. Acts 5. We see a, one of the coolest scenes in the book of Acts. We see men so bold for the faith, they get flogged for it. And they tell them, hey, you have one rule if you want to be set free. Just keep your mouth shut. Stop talking about Jesus. And they say, no way, dude. And they go right back into teaching and fill Jerusalem with the teachings of Jesus Christ. But one of the main persecutors who, were, who was the teacher of Paul, Gamaliel, the chief Pharisee over there, he stands up and tells the people something that I believe is true of us. Acts chapter 5 in verse 37. He mentions different revolutions like Judas and the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Verse 38, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human or origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men you will only find yourselves fighting against God. This is an amazing passage where he says, if you're trying to stop these men, and you can believe it, there's many people that want to stop God's movements. He said, you're only wasting your time. The Bible says in Zechariah that we will be like an immovable rock. Anyone who tries to move it will only injure themselves. And the Bible says that over here, if it is the movement of God, you can't stop it. And we know that God just wants a people of his own. The question is not, is God on our side? The question is, are we going to stay on God's side? And keep the convictions that we learned this past couple weeks. Keep the faith. There's no other way to be saved but become a baptized disciple. There's no other way to have a solid church and to call everyone to be committed. There's no other way but to be the movement of God. And I believe that what Gamaliel said of the first century will be said of us as well in the 21st century. Amen. That they tried to stop them over there in the West, but they couldn't stop them. They tried to stop them over there at UCLA, but they couldn't stop them. They tried to stop them over there at SMC, but they couldn't stop them. Over there in the South, they couldn't stop them. Over there at USC, over there at Dominguez Hills and El Camino. Why? Because we are the movement of God, and to God be the glory.